I thank you so much, Whitney. <laughs> You know, I tried to think of how to how to start this message this morning, and you know, the only analogy or that I could kind of come up with was, you know, I, I see, I like watching TV shows, and uh, it'll, it'll occasionally one will come on of a you know a man that has a a wife and a family in Detroit that he loves and he cherishes and just takes care of. He's the greatest dad and the greatest husband and you know all that. And he also has a wife and children in, you know, Philadelphia or somewhere else that he's, you know, they think he's just the greatest dad and he's, he's trying to live two separate lives. Guess what? It don't take long. Those two lives are in conflict with one another, aren't they? Somehow, someway, somebody gonna find out. And you know, we really, we, we only have one life to live. We can only live one life at a time. Amen. And, uh, but we're at constant conflict <laughs> with two different natures that are battling within us. And our scripture this morning in Galatians chapter two, uh, verse 20, kind of, it helps us to deal with that, to, to, to see that this morning. And uh, I'm gonna be real honest with you. I, I struggled mightily with the message this week of what to what to bring and, and the words to hear and uh, you know when when you're preaching to perfect people I, it's hard to come up with something that I need to preach on. So. But then I thought of Billy and so man I I got oh, Lord. <laughs> just kidding Billy. I know. Just kidding. I know. Uh, Galatians chapter two verse twenty. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Our most gracious Father, Lord God, I do pray this morning that you will clear my mind and clear my head and just let your spirit move through me and work through me and deliver the words that you would like for this congregation to hear this morning, for this gathering of people today, Father. Lord, it, we don't always fully understand the words. We hear the words, but we may not fully understand. And Lord, I pray today that you will give us understanding and, and a deeper knowledge and deeper meaning to what your words have to say. Father, I just pray today that the power of your spirit will work in our hearts and in our lives. Father, speak first and foremost to me. <coughs> Help me be the person that I should be, the follower that I should be, be the example that I need to be. And help your words to draw each one of us closer to you today. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to stand and be your servant and to be your minister to this people. And I pray that then you will continue to use me in whatever way you see fit. We ask all this in your blessed and holy name this morning. Amen. You know, as we look at these words this morning, they seem rather harsh and rather cruel that we're crucified. You know, we're talking about death and all of these different things, and, and we'll get into that in a little, little more. But, you know, as, as a Christian, we face conflict every day, do we not? Amen. The life of our flesh, our fleshly spirit, with its selfish desires and its selfish pleasures, is at a constant conflict with our spiritual life that desires to do good, that desires to serve God. But see, we can only live one of those lives, can't we? We can't live two different lives. We only have one life to live. Ergo, the title of my message this morning. But you know, the good thing to me or the 
a, a, a calming effect to me is not only do I have I live with that struggle, but I can read and I see that Christ also dealt with that same struggle. He was God, came to earth in flesh, and he had to deal with that same struggle of what his flesh wanted and what his spirit knew to be the right thing to do. And we see this uh, greatest example of this as he's in the Garden of Eden, as he knows he's going to be crucified the next day, and he knows the pain, he knows the agony that his body is going to endure, and his body is rebelling against that, is uh, not looking forward to that. And we see in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, and he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. See, Jesus confronted this conflict in his life first and foremost with prayer, didn't he? But he faced it and he overcame his fleshly <coughs> desire. His body recoiled at the thought and the knowledge of what it was about to endure. You and I, we see things in our life that we know that we're about to endure, and our flesh says, don't do that. But our spirit says, to serve God, we must endure this. We must forego some of the pleasures maybe that we have come to enjoy, or we may place ourselves in a, in a predicament of, of pain and, and agony. But we need to be crucified with Christ. And when he says with Christ, it's not in place of, and it's not for Christ, but it is alongside of Christ. Mm -hmm. Just as he crucified his flesh to serve the Father, we also must crucify our flesh to serve the Father. And this is a daily struggle for each and every one of us. As long as we live in this flesh, as long as our spirit is trapped within this flesh, we have this struggle. And that's why in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, we read, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily, daily, and follow me. Amen. It's an everyday event. It's an everyday occurrence. We don't ever get over. We get better at it as we practice it, as we uh, uh, participate in it. Uh, we get better at denying ourselves, at crucifying ourselves. But it, it's still a constant struggle. Even the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 19. The good that I want to do, I do not, or I do not do, but I practice the very evil I do not want to do. He also, as godly a man as he was, he had this same conflict himself that he had to fight with. He had the same conflict every day, and he would disappoint himself because as he would try to do the right thing, his body would lead him to do the wrong thing. And so we have this, this constant struggle, this constant conflict, and it's every day we wake up and make a decision to follow Christ and to do the best we can each and every moment of each and every day. And then he says, it's no longer I who live. Well, I'm still here. I'm still walking around. But see, we're dying to our fleshly spirit. We're dying to that we're, but then we're reborn with the Spirit of Christ. When we accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in and indwells us, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. That's, that is the same Spirit that uh, you know, Christ thou the courage to say, not my will, but your will. It's that same Spirit that will give us the strength to deny ourselves, to crucify ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. See, we're no longer who we were or what we were. 
our past is no more. And that is a freedom, is it not? What a freedom. We no longer have to carry the guilt and the shame and the burdens of our sinful past around with us like a boat anchor dragging us down. Amen. And it allows us the freedom to be what God has called us to be. We don't have to try to drag our sins along and you know try to pay them off with our good deeds, do we? Because in Psalms... 103 and 12, it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God has forgiven us and God has forgotten about them. He has removed our sins from us and from him. He yes. does that for us. He wipes our slate clean. He forgives us. And that is good because we're not able to do that in and of ourselves and through our own righteousness and through our own good deeds as Isaiah 64 and 6 says. Our righteous deeds are like a filthy rag in the sight of God. Amen. See, we can't, we can't do that. We have to have God to do that. Amen. And that is why we come to that. It is only by dying to ourselves daily and following God that we can be made righteous. But see, as we die to ourselves, and as we continue to live, we still live life in the flesh, don't we? This fleshly body is still here. As long as, as long as God allows us, we remain here on this earth inside this fleshly body. And so we're constantly at conflict with ourselves. We're still trapped within this fleshly body, but we must give control of that body over to the Holy Spirit who has come to dwell in us. We must give him complete control. In Matthew 6 and 24, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Just like the illustration of the man trying to hold up two families, sooner or later, something's going to give, and you just cannot serve the two different masters. <clears throat> Not that women are masters, but anyway. Uh, uh, we can only serve the one master at a time. It requires our complete, to total, totally and truly serve. We must be completely focused upon that one master and serve him and to do what he is called. Uh, you know, most of us, when we come to Christ, we think we need to turn our bad things over to God, don't we? We need to let him take control of those things and you know, we do. We call them the seven deadly sins is uh, one name that has been given to them. Greed, pride, lust, jealousy, covetousness, anger, and my favorite of all, slothfulness. Because my body wants to take a nap instead of going to work. I like my naps. I've gotten used to those naps and I can find nothing else to do is more important than doing what needs to be done sometimes. But we have those things, and we, we know when we come to Christ, we need to turn those things over to God. Don't we? let him take, help us with those, help us to improve those things. But you know what? Not only do we need to turn the bad part of our life over to God, we need to turn the good part of our life over to God. Amen. Tell you, don't we? we need to turn our families. We need to turn our finances. We need to turn our work. We need to turn our dreams, our visions, our ambitions over to God. Amen. Because not only will God help us to take the bad things and make them not so bad, to help us to overcome those things, but he can take the good things in our life and make them abundantly better. And he can fill those blessings in a way that we would never be able to in and of ourselves. So we need to turn complete control of our life over to our God. It is through obedience to Christ he can show us how to overcome, how to fulfill, and the joy and the, uh, that we will experience by turning those good things as well as those bad things over to God. When he is in total control, will be beyond our greatest uh, measure. And now, if we look at this, and this sounds harsh, and this sounds, you know, 
We're talking about death. We're talking about dying. We're talking about giving ourselves up. We're talking about giving control. And, you know, a lot of people look at that and say, well, okay, a Christian's just supposed to live this destitute Spartan life and not have any concern for anything and never enjoy anything that's good. And, and why would I want to be a Christian if I, if I can't have enjoy the things of this world? That's not what God is telling us about, is it? It's our attitude towards the things that we do. You know, we look at, let's, let's say doctors and lawyers. They both make a lot of money, right? Well, what is their attitude? What is their purpose for doing the occupation? Is a doctor, does a person become a doctor strictly so that he can become rich, so that he can have lots of money, so that he can pamper himself and have the big house and the big cars and the cabin in the mountains and all of those things or does he become a doctor because he wants to help those who are sick, those who are hurting does he want to try to help out those who are in, in need that he can you know, bring aid to and in the meantime if he receives you know, we, put, we place a, a great cost on, on life don't we? and so if he gains great revenue from that that's not necessarily wrong, but it's his attitude towards that. Same way with a lawyer. You know, if a lawyer just becomes a lawyer just so that he can become rich and so that he can become powerful and so he can dictate and overrun people, shame on him. But if he becomes a lawyer to try to help the downtrodden and the, correct the injustices in, work, in the world, and it as a side effect of that, he becomes wealthy. That's not a bad deal, but how does he then how does he use that wealth? Is it all again about him or is it about how he can further help other people with that? It's our attitude towards those things, and it's what we're doing with that when we realize that everything we have, everything that is in, in our life is a gift from God. Amen. And it has come from God, and so we're offering it back to him to utilize it to the best that he can, that we can, to serve God. God wants us to have life and to have it more abundantly. So when we are crucified to ourselves, it means that we're not putting ourselves first. Amen. It means that we're putting God first. And let God bless our bodies. Let God bless bless those things we have a vision for our life and if we put God out of that life then that vision will only get to a certain point but if we put God in our life and we have that vision and let God fulfill that vision it will be in abundance to what you and I could ever even, even imagine it would be Amen. so when we, we look at this, these verses they sound harsh and it sounds like a way that you know the, the world is saying well I don't want to be a Christian if I'm going to have to live that way. That's not the intent and the purpose here. The intent and the purpose is the focus in our life, the control of our life. What is our attitude towards God? And if we're trying to do it ourselves we're so small that we can't envision it but God's got a great Amen. And if we will die to ourselves and let God take control of our life, it will be so much more than what we believe. But our bodies, we, we want the right here and the right now, don't we? Amen. You know, we have a hard time disciplining ourselves to say that, you know, I won't have that right now so I can do these activities. And somewhere later down the line, I'm going to have two of them. Okay? We, we, we get the, so caught up in the right here and the right now. You know, my body really wants, wants an app right now, but if I can stay awake and work just a little harder, Paul, pay attention to what the preacher has to say, I might gain something out of this. You're awake this morning, I'm just being. So we have to cru be crucified to ourselves. We have to live a life not of us, but of Christ. But as we continue in this life, our life is about serving Christ. Amen. And let God bless us. Let God do what he wants to do.
Have we been crucified with Christ? Have we given all of our life to Christ? Or are we still trying to live two separate lives? We'll give God these certain things that are like, you know, you take care of my anger, you take care of my greed, but I'm going to take care of my finances and I'm going to take care of my family. Have we turned it all over? Have we truly given our heart and our life to Christ? That is the question that we have to answer this morning. Have you been crucified? And do you crucify yourself daily? Or is it just a Sunday morning? activity. Would you stand with me please this morning? See, we can only understand that when we give our heart and our life to Christ. And then we have to begin to work with that. And if you have not given your heart to Jesus today, today would be a great time to do that. But it means a sacrifice. It means to be crucified. It means to give up your desires and do the desires of God. Our most gracious Father, if there's we come this morning, Father, just thanking you for this day. We thank you for your word. Father, we pray that you'll give us the faith and give us the spirit to let go of the control of our life and stop letting our fleshly bodies dictate and drive us and turn things over to you and let you guide us and direct us because what you have for us is so much more than what we could provide for ourselves. Father, if there's anyone today that has not given their life to you, that is maybe trying to take control back, Father, give them this opportunity to come and get things right with you this morning. Father, we love you today. We thank you so much for all the ways you bless us. We thank you for the reins that you've given us. Father, just give us the wisdom and understanding to be good stewards of the blessings you have given to us and to use them for your honor and your glory. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. As J.L. comes, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If God's speaking to you this morning, you come, please.